This morning is about energy and the Prime Minister will make nuclear the backbone of Britain's new energy strategy which will be published today. Up to new eight new reactors are planned in a bid to have 95% of Britain's power come from domestic renewable sources by 2030. So targets for onshore wind and solar power generation will also be raised and the strategy is being announced against the backdrop of soaring energy bills and pressure to end the West's reliance on Russian oil and gas. Well, according to Whitehall, uh, rise over the strategy between Number 10 and the Treasury and the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy were ongoing up until last night. In other words, it's all a mess. <laughs> uh, Labour has accused Boris Johnson of caving to his own backbenchers and that the strategy would do nothing to help the millions of families facing an energy crisis. Okay. So, all of this comes as the Foreign Secretary meets with other foreign ministers of the G7 countries in a push for a hard deadline on the ending of the West's reliance on Russian oil. Andy Mayer, energy analyst at the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, joins us. Well, I don't think this is Andy Mayer. I think this is Simon Hinks, is it? It sure is. Eh? It sure is. Well, there we are. Let's... I think we're going to Andy Mayer first, are oh, we? Are we? Yes, oh, I well, believe right. so. Okay. Yes, right. we're going to Andy Mayer first from the IEA. Uh, a very good morning to you, Andy. Uh, look, are we going nuclear? Do you see it going that way? Well, there's a big nuclear strategy in there, and the government's got very ambitious plans to build seven to eight new reactors. Uh, the difficulty is that their own impact assessments that was released earlier in the week strongly suggest they're going to really struggle to do that. So what it said was that it would take 13 to 17 years to build each reactor, and that's after they've made the initial investment decision, which won't be happening for most of them until the next parliament. So we could be looking at the 2040s before most of these things are actually in the ground. Um, the whole thing's a mess. It's not joined up. It's about pleasing every lobby group there is in the country. And we've got to get on with it. We've got to do something. Then you get people like Liz Truss going to the G7 and saying, oh, well, who let this Russian oil thing happen? Got to stop this. Well, I suggest it was your government that let it happen. Um, you know, it, it is a mess. I just look at it and I think it is an absolute mess and it's all talk from politicians. How are we going to get this sorted, sorted out in a way that it will help, it will take the pain away from the, the fuel crisis and, the, and the, the cost of living that people are actually going through? Yeah, so just on the first point, uh, all of the lobby groups are un equally unhappy. So The Guardian kicked off last night by accusing the government of picking losers. We're not very happy because the central message from the strategy is your bills are going to stay high and they're going to get much more expensive because what the government's done is retreated from the only period in British history where energy policy was a success, which was when it was liberalized in the 1990s and towards the early part of the century. And they've gone back to this old model of central state planning where the wise man in the ministry and his civil servants are going to di dictate what we need as the public without very much input from us. So there's a lot of expense built in everywhere. And what they could have done is taken the, the opportunity. Energy the, the energy strategy was liberalized. What, what, do you mean, what do you mean by that? OK, so the when you, thing yeah. we used to have was the Central Electricity Generating Board, which tried to centrally plan electricity when it was a lot simpler. What we've got now is a vast grid, which is extremely complicated because we need lots of smaller power stations on it, like the solar panels and the wind turbines. And those power sources are intermittent. So they're all sparking off against each other. And when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, you need lots of gas back up because none of the other storage options are available or cheap. And what that creates is a vast amount of waste, inefficiency and expense. And what the government could have done is said, OK, we're going to be driven instead by market prices. We're going to have a carbon price that lets us reach our net zero ambition. And we're going to have other things built in there. So there's always something on. We, know we don't want insecurity of supply. We don't want blackouts. But otherwise, just let the market decide. And that means you get the cheapest energy options first not these giant corporate plans for nuclear power stations and future technology that doesn't exist yet. Stuff that will frankly be invented elsewhere and made cheap by other people rather than at the expense of the British bill pay. 
Um, Andy Mayer, do you think that enough is being talked about in relation to actually just reducing demand? It seems to be we're just focusing on trying to find new sources, but we're not talking about simple things. And I'm, just an anecdote from the team I've been speaking to here this morning. Everybody was saying to me that they were freezing in their hotel rooms last night. This hotel it has air conditioning pumping out all through the night. Nobody wants it. We're all freezing. We're I in want it. Manchester. I want it. Really? Yes. Well, we, at least two people said they had it on 30, trying to get it as warm as they could, myself included. Why are we wasting money on air conditioning when we live in England? Why are we wasting money and, you know, just letting our heat pour out of the ceilings rather than properly insulating our homes and our offices? Well, although most of the green groups disagree, I think this is the one area where the government's probably more right than wrong, because what they're doing is saying actually energy prices are really high and that will have a consequence. I mean, that hotel you're in, maybe the prices they're charging are high enough that they can get away with putting the air conditioning on. But quite a lot of other places are saying, no, actually, we're going to turn these things down, we're going to turn them off because we can't afford it. And that's happening across the country. Millions of individual decisions are being made. You know, do we need to leave the lights on? Do we need to turn the thermostat down? And the government needs to do nothing about that. This is demand side response through the price mechanism, as it should be. If they started acting on that, they started developing new policies to offer to th insulate people's homes for them, all they would do is distort what's happening already and misallocate resources, which is where a lot of this waste comes from. So the Green Groups have got this wrong. The government have got it right. They should let the price mechanism work and leave it alone for now. Andy Mayer, you are an analyst, right? So how do you analyse the F word, fracking? Well, fracking is just a technique for getting the same molecules out of the ground as we get out of the North Sea. Now, the government um, is very welcome. They've decided they're going to actually get out of the way on the North Sea, but bizarrely have decided that onshore fracking, which happens one to three kilometers below the ground, is very difficult and very dangerous, which it isn't. We already know this from a decade of experience from the US industry, but in the UK, we had a very silly debate where people were catastrophizing and being hysterical about small earth movements, which are the sort of thing that happened from any sort of extractive industry or construction. The entire industry got banned because of an earth movement that was about half as intense as one you would experience from normal construction operations. So it's really a really bad decision. It's great to see the government have put that into review, but the review itself is pretty weak. It does look like it could go either way. And they may simply have done it to kick the can down the road to get themselves past the local elections. Yeah. But we do need gas. This so, is a gas so, supply crisis. So you're saying to us that um, fracking was banned for unscientific reasons, and simply for politicians because they couldn't take the heat from the lobbyists. Yeah, it's exactly the same motivation. It's not about the lobbyists here. It's about local people protesting development anywhere. I mean, I live in Surrey. This is NIMBY Central. We will protest the opening of a packet of crisps here, let alone anything like a fracking site or a solar farm or a wind farm or a nuclear power station. If the government keeps maintaining planning rules that allow local residents associations to veto anything happening in their area, we won't have fracking, we won't have the renewable energy, we won't frankly have homes for young people. So they need to bite that bullet and take planning on. They need to make sure that strategic energy resources like these can actually be built. Doesn't matter which technology, but they've all got to be there. And we've all got to have that to have security of supply. So let's get fracking. Andy